This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Ninety-two percent of Canadians have expressed some level of concern with respects to their privacy. And 81% of those Canadians want clear rules to protect their data. And 74% of those Canadians think that they actually have less protection today than they did 10 years ago. While most of the Canadian digital policy world was focused over the summer and early fall, On various federal consultations on online harms and copyright reform, the Quebec government quietly passed Bill 64, a major privacy reform package that reflects and even goes beyond many emerging international privacy law approaches. With the federal government, along with multiple provinces expected in the coming months to undertake long overdue privacy reform, Quebec has marched ahead and established a standard by which other laws will likely be judged. Chantal Bernier, the former Interim Privacy Commissioner of Canada, now leads the Denton's law firm Canadian Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group. She joins me on the podcast to talk about Bill 64, including its origins, key provisions, and its implications for privacy law in Canada. Chantal, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. My pleasure. Yeah, no, it's great to have you come on. Uh, As you know, Canada's efforts to modernize or update its privacy laws have stalled. Bill C-11, which was the attempt to update PIPA, seemingly never really went anywhere. But there's been far more activity at the provincial level. You know, Ontario, BC, Alberta all have initiatives. But once again, for privacy historians, it's Quebec that's leading the way. And with, I think, relatively little fanfare, at least outside of Quebec, Bill 64, Quebec's Quebec's new privacy law, in effect, received royal assent uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So most of the provisions won't take effect for a couple of years, but people surely need to start paying attention now. Can you, I think, start us off a little bit with some background on the bill, or I guess now on the law, and what brought us to this point? Sure. I think it's important to mention right at the outset that Bill 64 is very much grounded in the existing privacy law for the private sector in Quebec, so that it is truly faithful to Quebec's legal tradition in relation to privacy. So that puts us in context because, of course, it signals a very much Quebec distinct approach. The bill is uh, very much uh, consequential across Canada. First of all, because it sets a precedent, just as you said, Michael, there is a lot of movement in the provinces as well. So they are looking at Bill 64 And if you read Ontario's white paper on modernization of privacy law, I found it quite striking. On the one hand, how it expresses admiration and shows leaning towards the uh, clauses of Bill 64, while at the same time, uh, quite critical of Bill C-11. So you can see that there may be rifts uh, that will occur. Before getting into to some of the substance of the law, it's it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, you make the case that it's going to have some impact in other jurisdictions. Can you give some insight into some of the politics and the policy development here? Because, you know, when I think of what we've seen take place at the federal level, uh, you know, we had a bill, never really went anywhere. It didn't seem to have much support either from those looking for stronger privacy rules or or from the business community. And it feels as if the government kind of just threw up its hands and said, well, if nobody's all that interested in it, we're not going to be all that interested in it either. I guess what made Quebec different here? What, you know, what's what sparked not just the introduction of privacy legislation, but the ability to to see it through to the finish line? Well, actually, there was a major spectacular security breach in Quebec, remember? So that was very much, I think, the spark. We have to look 
take this into account to sort of foresee, as you were saying, Michael, sort of where is the policy going? First of all, uh, Bill 64 is entirely grounded into the existing privacy law and former Bill C-11 as well. So clearly there seems to be an entrenchment in traditional approaches to privacy law. So Bill C-11 was introduced uh, in the context that is not much talked about, but that is that Canada is recognized as being adequate in relation to PIPEDA by the European Commission, which means that European companies can transfer data to organizations that are governed by PIPEDA without further authorization. So really smoothing the regulatory framework for trade. And that's an advantage Canada wants to keep. And therefore they have to upgrade, so to speak, PIPEDA to make it equivalent to the General Data Protection Regulation because Canada's adequacy will be, again, reviewed. So they want to make sure they still pass the test. And finally, you will recall, Michael, that um, Bill C-10 and Bill C-12 were given priority. So that squeezed Bill C-11, if not out, at least in the background, and then the elections were called. So that's really what I think stalled C-11. Okay, so that's what stalled C-11. Uh, and I agree with you, the, the government clearly found some other priorities. But so it's your but it's your sense that that in a, that in a sense, the the large uh, privacy breach referring, of course, to Desjardins uh, had the effect of really galvanizing uh, at a political level and presumably at a, at a public level as well, a recognition that privacy laws were in need of updating. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so it's interesting to see that that it had that effect. We, in certain respects, haven't seen that same same thing play out, uh, at least not to the same degree uh, at the at the federal level, or at least outside of Quebec, where, of course, there have been some major privacy related issues, but uh, hasn't yet translated into those reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the now they've obviously seeking to to address a, a pretty wide range of issues with respect to this uh, this piece of legislation, why don't we start with consent, which of course mm -hmm. forms the foundation of privacy law and has proven to be increasingly challenging in the digital environment. The, the, the federal bill proposed some changes that proved uh, quite controversial. Uh, what changes are we going to see as part of the Quebec legislation? So the Quebec legislation enhances uh, the requirements for consent in particular requiring now that it is be specific to each purpose. And um, also that it has some very clear and fairly limited exceptions uh, with respect to where the operation by the company does not require consent. So there are the exceptions are, for example, to protect against uh, fraud, uh, to improve security measures. But the point is that there is now a finite list of activities that um, will allow to proceed without consent. There is, one could say that they're a bit uh, open in the sense that one of the exceptions, for example, is if it is necessary to collect the personal information to provide the services or the product. Well, one could say, well, that's pretty broad. But still, it does bring a discipline around uh, collecting personal information with or without consent that did not exist until now. Okay, so we're starting to see some changes there. I think for many, what makes the bill most interesting is is getting into some of the new digital issues and there are a whole series of of them that you know have been talked about in the privacy community uh, and we've seen them in other jurisdictions but this this in many ways represents one of the first time we're actually seeing it put into law in canada there's a there's a bunch i wanted to go through why don't we start with the use of de-identified and anonymized information which which c uh c11 sought to deal with as well again uh raising uh, some controversy for some, how, how, how will Quebec be addressing that issue? So this is such an interesting part, Michael, because I like to call it the uh, new Quebec 
white revolution because it seems pretty innocuous, but in fact, it is a revolution. Until now in Canada, information that was anonymized to the point that it could no longer relate to an identified individual was not within the scope of privacy law. Simply was not governed by any privacy law. You could do whatever you wanted with it because it was no longer personal information. Now, it is brought within privacy law. And there's an interconnection here between C11 and 64. So as you just said, C11 introduced a strict governance framework around what they called de-identified information. But when you read the definition of de-identification, de-identify, it was actually what is elsewhere considered anonymized. So essentially C11 was really restricting the use of anonymized information. And through the Commission Parlementaire in Quebec reviewing 64, they actually did introduce a requirement that wasn't there when the government proposed the bill, which is that now anonymized information can only be used for serious and legitimate purposes. So you see how much did C11 spark the idea in the study of 64 that, oops, nowadays we can no longer speak of anonymized information because there's so much information on the internet and because the data mining and matching capabilities are such that it's always relatable to a person. So did that influence the discussion in 64? The fact is that the outcome is that through parliamentary review, there was a condition applied to the use of anonymized information. And that is a first, uh, not just in Canadian law, because in Europe, it is not the case. In Europe, the general data protection regulation does not apply to anonymized information. Yeah, no, it's, it's extremely interesting. And you know, certainly the, the position has long been in privacy law that, that sort of the standard way that it, that it applies is to personally identifiable information. And, of course, organizations have, have reacted to that by taking the position, well, if I anonymize it, it's not related to a particular person, and therefore I fall outside of the framework. Now, you're describing a, a scenario whereby that, that that's no longer the case, that the ability to put Humpty Dumpty back together again in some of these <laughs> circumstances is very real, and the law is responding. How how is the, how are the business community or some others who you know, are accustomed to operating under under, under the kinds of rules that we just described, one in which you can extricate yourself from these frameworks so long as things are anonymous. How have they reacted to this prospect that suddenly now there is layered in this new kind of restriction for information that, that previously was seen as outside the scope of uh, privacy protections? They reacted with profound concern because anonymized information has been an extraordinary source of knowledge. That's how you can innovate. That's how you can improve. That's how you can understand. Anonymized information has allowed, for example, to see trends among consumers without any correlation to the consumer. And so that wealth of knowledge, understanding, insight is now significantly restricted in terms of access and use. So it really must be considered how we want to balance the real risk of re-identification. I mean, is it only theoretical or is it material? And the need for government and organizations, universities, companies to actually 
access anonymized information for progress. Yeah, no, it's definitely going to be a difficult uh, mm. policy issue to navigate. And it'll be very interesting once this takes effect to see how companies respond, given that, you know, established practices in so many jurisdictions will differ somewhat. You know, one of the other areas that, that in some ways fairly closely related um, is has to do with automated decision making. So lots of data in that can then result in, in automated decision making. And of course, we've seen a lot of focus broadly, not just in the privacy realm, but more broadly about uh, potentials for bias and other sorts mm -hmm. of concerns around the use of, of AI as part of decision making. Uh, the bill introduces some requirements related to this issue, related to automated decision making involving personal information. Uh, what does it say? And how does the, in this instance, the, the Quebec approach compare to what's found elsewhere? So it is actually comparable to, to the general data protection regulation. And it, first of all, introduces transparency requirements, meaning that a company that does use, an organization that does use uh, automatic decision making must be open about it and must describe, at least in general terms, how it uses it. And then it offers this new access right whereby an individual will be able to request access to the information that was used to make the automatic decision and to present observations. So hopefully this would address um, the very real danger that we've seen over and over again materialize, which is algorithmic bias. But that is, um, the privacy pathway is used towards that end by grounding access to the data that forms the auto automatic decision making in the right to privacy, which is that you are the ultimate owner of your personal information. And therefore, the way it is used to make decisions about you you have the right to know. So this is a, a very uh, big change that will address, I think, quite a few digital issues to go back to your introduction as to how privacy law is really geared now to address the digital privacy risks. Yes. No, speaking of, of the, that ownership side in privacy, I know that one of the other aspects that, uh, that Bill 64 seeks to address is data portability, which has mm. come up, which has come up regularly in the context of things like open banking and the mm. notion that uh, that individuals should be the ones in control and should be able to move their data as they see fit. Uh, does the law speak to, to some of those issues? Yes, and this is another clause of Bill 64 that actually was amended through the Commission Parlementaire. So the bill creates the right to portability, meaning that uh, we, um, since we are the owners of the right, we will be able to obtain that our personal information that we have provided to an organization be transferred in a structured, readable way to another organization upon our request. The amendment through the Commission Parlementaire was to actually clarify that it does not apply to data created by the organization or inferred by the organization on the individual. So let's say that the organization I give my information to for service has obviously, let's say my address and phone number, and whatever, and they give the service. Um, let's say it's a regular service. And on the basis of my repeated requests, they draw a profile about me. So that is not subject to the right to portability. All that is subject to the right to portability is the information that I provided. Okay, is, is there a middle ground there? Is there? I, I, one can understand why certain 
certain pieces of data that the organization develops independently, though using some of my data uh, might be seen as not my data to take. But uh, there may be other pieces of data that that sort of kind of fall in a bit of a middle ground, thinking of, of sort of some of the basic banking information, uh, some of my own financial stuff that I may have provided or that the bank may have taken as part of some of the various transactions. You know, at what point in time, how do we know what the dividing line is between what is mine in a sense and what is say the banks? So of course, um, this is such a relevant question. When does the data go from provided to observed to inferred? And of course the line between observed and inferred is uh, blurry. But perhaps the middle ground is not so much on defining that, but on defining the individual rights to it. So the information that I have provided cannot be subject to any proprietary right. Therefore, that one has to be subject to portability because there's no competing claim to it. However, the personal information that was drawn about me through, let's say, an algorithm that the organization has developed and therefore is subject to proprietary rights. Well, there, okay, so I'm not entitled to portability because that would go against the proprietary rights of the organization, but why wouldn't I be allowed to access it? So at least I can see. And that is what the access uh, to the automatic de decision systems uh, functioning does. So, okay, it's not portable. What, what the organization has inferred about me is not portable, but I now have the right to know what it is that they have inferred about me. Interesting. Now, speaking of, of, of new rights or rights that I might have in, in information where there's also challenges at times to, to sort of find or identify where the appropriate dividing line is, uh, involves the right to be forgotten. And you know, this is you know, now something that's been around for, for a number of years in Europe. We've talked about it on this podcast on a number of occasions as well with some of the, the Canadian cases that have begun exploring the prospect of, of reading, reading it into existing Canadian law. Uh, does, it, or does it or how does the, the Quebec law speak to this issue? Yeah. So it does recognize the right to be forgotten. And um, it was almost unavoidable because of the differential impact of the internet. It used to be that there would be news about an individual in a newspaper and well, it would just be forgotten. <laughs> and now uh, you search the name and all that comes up is that 10 years ago, the individual was involved in whatever. So. So the differential impact of the internet really needed to be addressed. So what Bill 64 does is that it does allow uh, to request de-indexation of personal information. So the individual makes this request. And if there are no competing interest, the organization must indeed the index a competing um, consideration would be public interest the public interest to know there are areas where i'm sure individuals would be very happy to remove the information but actually uh, it is of public interest it was about them in the performance of their political uh, position and, and so on so that's really what uh, the right to be forgotten is um to cover in Bill 64. Okay, so pretty broad range of, of, of new rights and powers, everything as we've been talking about from de-identifying and an anonymized information rules, some of the issues around automated decision-making, data portability, right to be forgotten. There's a lot there, but some would say that a privacy law is only as good as its enforcement. It only really matters if organizations are willing to abide by some of these rules and enforcement is often a major factor in that. Uh, is there an attempt to try to address the enforcement side with more powers or penalties as part of this law? Yeah, that is the other revolution that's happening in Canadian privacy law. Until now, we Canadians had decided 
to function on the basis of the ombudsman model, meaning that the regulator was merely a mediator, so to speak, between the individual complaining about use and collection of personal information and the respondent organization, making recommendations. And the idea was to offer a process that was free, that was not overly burdensome on the individual, and that left quite a bit of discretion to the organizations. But that was uh, before even Facebook was created, right? Pipita was actually adopted before Facebook was created. And so now we have an unbalance between the individual and the organization that processes the data that is so incredibly asymmetrical that we had to reinforce the middle, which was, which is the regulator. It's, it's what I like to call mediated accountability. We had to reinforce the powers of the regulator so that the regulator could truly act upon the organizations. The other factor is that data has become such a source of revenue, of income. So the only way to ensure data is not misused is to make sure that misuse is as costly as use is profitable. So huge fines now have been created to precisely address the, the monetization of personal information. That is the phenomenon. So the fines seek to bring uh, the organizations in line by making them understand that they will pay the high price if they breach the trust of the individuals that uh, provide them their personal information. That's a really interesting way of, of putting it, this notion that uh, the, the, the cost associated with with failing to with misusing information or failing to abide by the law needs to be commensurate with the profitability that comes from using that information in the first place. I think that's that's an interesting way of of thinking about this issue. You know, why don't we conclude with with this as we think about both the implications that this law has within Quebec and I guess more broadly across the country? Do you think it's likely across some of these issues to influence some of the other Canadian laws, whether at the provincial level or even more notably, I guess, at the federal level? And, and what kind of adjustment do you see from, from the business community? Are they simply going to say, okay, fine, these are the rules and, and we'll play, we'll, we'll adjust as, as needed? Or do you expect over the, the next couple of years, as they gear up for this, uh, some amount of, of pushback or attempts to see if there isn't some wiggle room in the actual implementation at the end of the day? So I think that there are some uh, new rules that, he, that industry would admit are really a good idea. Strengthening the whole internal compliance requirements, industry would say, yeah, you know, I, we really need to manage the protection of personal information at the level that it is now at risk with the digital platforms. Where I sense, and this is on the basis of what I read and what I hear, what I sense will be pushed against is the identification and anonymization, um, the extent uh, of regulation of that kind of information will certainly be a contentious issue between the government and industry. What I also believe will be a contentious issue is the mechanisms for consent. The industry, I think, will push back on mechanisms that they feel are not only cumbersome, but futile because they create so much friction that the consumer just clicks, 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 clicks until you know all this goes away and does not actually read. So 
I see those, if I had to pick only two that would be the most susceptible to push back using your term, I would say those two would be top of the list. Okay, interesting. So in other words, we're, we're likely to, to see this both play a, a role as a model for some of the legislation that we see unfold both federally and, and in some provinces as well. But at the same time, the the battle, whether it's a political battle or a policy battle, or just the way it gets implemented, does it sounds like it isn't over yet on, on certain issues, even within Quebec, because as we've been saying there, the, the law has been passed, but it's there are still a couple of years before it actually takes effect. Exactly. And of course, there's the interpretation of the new rules. So just to go back to the example I gave earlier on about anonymization, anonymized information can only be used for serious and legitimate purposes. Well, what is that? So that is really open to evolution still. Okay. Interesting. Well, we're going to be paying close attention and, and hopefully if we want to come back uh, sometime in the future as we start seeing some of those interpretations and we see some of these issues play out uh, and uh, as are in the continued effort to both take a look at what's taking place globally, but also obviously pay really close attention to what's happening on the privacy front here in Canada. Chantal, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Very happy to. Thank you, Michael. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to LawBytes at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at LawBytesPod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The LawBytes podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.